Uh, good morning and welcome to Trinity Reformed Church. Happy Thanksgiving to everyone. It's a wonderful week that we can remember to be thankful. Remember what we are thankful for. And the wonderful nation that we live in, our families, our friends, but most especially for our Savior and our God. Our call to worship this morning comes from the 65th Psalm. It begins, Praise is awaiting you, O God in Zion, and to you the vow shall be performed. O you who hear prayer, to you all flesh will come. Iniquities prevail against me as for our transgressions. You will provide atonement for them. Blessed is the man you choose and cause to approach you that he may dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house. Now I'd like to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Zechariah chapter 9. I'm actually going to be starting in verse 13 and reading through verse 17. So Zechariah chapter 9 verses 13 through 17. Here's the reading from God's word. For I have bent Judah my bow, fitted the bow with Ephraim, and raised up your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece, and made you like the sword of a mighty man. Then the Lord will be seen over them, and his arrow will go forth like lightning. The Lord God will blow the trumpet and go with whirlwinds from the south. The Lord of hosts will defend them, they shall devour and subdue with sling stones. They shall drink and roar as with wine. They shall be filled with blood like basins, like the corners of the altar. The Lord their God will save them in that day as the flock of his people. For they shall be like the jewels of a crown, like a banner over his head, land. For how great is its goodness and how great its beauty. Grain shall make the young men thrive, and new wine for the young women. Here ends the reading of God's word. Let's bow our heads in prayer. <clears throat> Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we praise you with thanksgiving. We praise you for the bounty of our lives, for, for providing for us a land of peace to live in. Even though there is turmoil at times, Lord, we have been blessed. And we ask for your blessing to continue. Lord, we are thankful, most of all, for the sending of your Son, Jesus Christ. For his birth, his human life, and his death upon a cross. We know that through his death, and through his renewed life, Lord, that we are saved. That you have given us faith in him. Faith in the life that is to come. Faith in the victory over sin and death, which we could never have done on our own. So we ask that you would forgive the idols in our lives. That, Lord, you would focus our hearts and our minds completely upon you would see that all we have, all there is, comes from you alone. Lord Father, this morning we pray especially for Paul Trike. And Lord, ask for his healing, ask that he would be able to breathe easy and rejoin us. Most of all, Lord, we pray for your peace in his heart. He always knows that you are there, no matter what the crisis. Father, I ask that you would also be with Debbie and with Emily as their legs heal. That, Lord, you would give them the calmness that they need to be able to sit, to heal, to recuperate. And, Lord, that you would heal their flesh. Heavenly Father, we have sorrow for those who are not in our midst. 
We pray for those who are missing in any of your churches due to infirmity or illness, due to travels, due to being isolated in a distant land. Lord, we ask that your gospel would gird them up, that your peace would be with them, that your word would be on their tongues and in their hearts. For Lord, we know that to live is Christ, to die is gain, to live is to serve, yet to die is to be truly with you. So, Lord, we rejoice in the great sacrifice that you have given, the sacrifice to end all sacrifices, the sacrifice that washes us clean, Sacrifice of your Son, Jesus Christ. Gracious Lord, we ask for the, the, the zeal, the exuberance of knowing you, of living for you, of knowing that there's nothing in this world that can set us back, that can take us away from your loving hand. Father, we pray for your strength strength to carry on, the strength to preach your word, and the wisdom to know when to point in a different direction, the wisdom to know when we've cast our pearls before swine, to those who won't listen, to those who won't make, it won't make a difference. And Father, the wisdom to see where it will, to see where our ministry can light that spark that calls one more to faith in your Son, Jesus Christ. For Lord, we are your tool. We are your herald to this world. Lord, we praise you humbly for giving us such a job to do. Praise you with joy, knowing that we take good news out into the world, that in this season where we wait the celebration of the birth of our Lord, in this season of Advent, that we can speak your name and people will listen, that we can speak with joy, Christ has been born. And some will hear, and some will know, that we can sing your songs, songs of praise, songs of joy, songs of revelation. Lord, we ask that we lend our voices strength. Lord, most of all, we ask that your blessing would be upon our church on our denomination you would bless their ministry bless their witness to the world Lord keep them safe and secure in your almighty arms that with every breath we would serve you well so Father we pray to you in Jesus name praying as he taught us to pray Saint, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may have noticed that the bulletin shows the passage as Zechariah 14 through 17, and I read from verse 13 this morning. And I did so so that I would give the full context from starting from what I spoke of last week. And of course, you must look at what is happening here in context. As we saw last time, God's people are to rejoice. 
for the promise of the coming Messiah. They were to rejoice for the Lord was on their side. The Lord was sending his king and the people of God are to be prisoners of hope, captivated by the glory and grace of God. You have to set your hope upon the Lord through Christ alone. And we saw that the Lord would make his people the weapon of his war against the world, against the rebellion that the world fights against God. As we come to verse 9, 13 in Zechariah, there's a distinct change in tone, and this occurs because this is speaking of the actions of the Lord, the actions of God himself. The people of God are to don the full, of ar full armor of God, the armor of peace and armor of faith and hope and love and let the Lord lead them into the battle. It's with the power of the Lord that the battles are fought and won for Christ. And that is what we begin to see here. Now, remember, this is happening in post-exilic Israel. And a time would soon come when the prophecy is partially fulfilled in the time of the Maccabees. I mentioned the Seleucids, the Greeks that were running the area of Syria on down into uh, Israel and Judea last time. The main guy there was named Antiochus Epiphanes. And he not only turned the temple of God in Jerusalem into a temple for the worship of Zeus, he commanded that all the Jewish villages would sacrifice to Zeus, as well as sacrifice at the temple of God, and that all the Jews would eat pork, of course an unclean animal for the Jews. And that was pretty much the last straw. And in 167 BC or thereabouts, a man named Judas, the son of Mattathias, rose up and led a revolt against the Greek Seleucids and fought them for a few years and in the end won a massive victory when all the odds were stacked completely against him. Israel's never been a mighty military power. The Greeks should have been able to walk over them without a second thought. But exactly three years after the desecration of the temple on December 14th, 164 BC, the temple was rededicated and daily sacrifices were restored to the temple. And thus began the celebration of the Feast of Dedication. <coughs> Of Hanukkah. In that first conflict, the Maccabees never experienced defeat. The Lord was truly with them, and they came to be called the Maccabees because they had crushed the Greeks that were ruling over them and subverting the worship of God. Maccabee means hammer or hammerhead, so Judas the hammer crushed the Greeks more than 150 years before the advent of Jesus Christ. The Lord was with his people. The Lord saved his people, leading them to victory. But that was not the complete fulfillment of this prophecy. The people of God were not ruling over the nations. Where was this king that would come in riding on a donkey? They knew that this was a prophecy that required additional fulfillment and repetition, and they knew that it was speaking of the Messiah and the need for the Messiah to come in victory. There was this great victory over the Greek world, and yet it was fleeting and not complete, and soon the Romans, of course, would come on the scene and conquer all. There had to be more the promise of God. But you have to always remember that the Lord isn't looking for military 
victories of human might, victories of our own, you might say. The Lord wants his people to rely on him and his might to win the day. That has always been the message of the Lord from the moment that he gave his written word. God wants man, the creation that is made in his image, to live for him, to glorify him by relying upon God for all his needs, to live with and for God with all of your being. So when you look at this passage, and passages like this, look to see what God is doing. That is the key to understanding. In verse 14 it reads, The Lord will be seen over his people. It is the might of the Lord that brings the victory. It is the arrow of God that goes forth like lightning, the arrow that he's made Ephraim into. Look at the imagery there. The Lord is seen over his people and sends forth lightning. The Lord blows his trumpet, and there are whirlwinds from the south, images of storm and tempests doing his bidding to win victory for his people. There are two things that this imagery brings to mind. And the first is that the worst storms in the area generally came from the south. And so there is this idea of the Lord commanding the strongest of the storms. There's also imagery of the Lord giving his law and meeting with his people on, at Mount Sinai and showing his immeasurable power. And you can see allusions to the same idea in the third chapter of Habakkuk as he writes that the Lord came from Timon, the Holy One from Mount Paran. Habakkuk then goes on to describe the great power of God. The Lord in his power is amazing. It's wondrous. It's glorious. A terrifying sight to his enemies, and yet pure beauty to those who fear and serve the Lord. There is great joy in being covered by the shield of an almighty king, of knowing that you are safe behind his bulwark. This is a blessing that we can relate to. War hasn't touched our nation's homeland in over a century. The United States has been truly blessed in that it hasn't been overrun in war and destruction. Through might of its military, it's been able to take the war to others. But think of that power multiplied because it's wielded by God. It's his own power, unlimited power over his creation power that we can't begin to comprehend, and a power that can destroy with a word, and yet bring forth life with a word. A power that can breathe a soul into a man. The power that can save that man from destruction. That is the Lord you serve through faith in Jesus Christ. That is the Lord that defends his own, a Lord that is so powerful that his people will subdue the world. Not only winning the victory, but winning with exuberance, being full of excitement and energy, full of life and zeal. Look at what verse 15 is saying. They shall subdue with sling stones. It's the humblest of weapons. The weapon of David when he slew Goliath. The weapon of a shepherd. They shall drink and roar as if they are with wine. That's drunk. They will revel in their victory with the Lord. There's tremendous excitement here. It's not saying they are drunk, but they're going to revel as if they were. And then we see that they will be filled with blood as a basin. 
what this is speaking of are the basins that the priests would catch the blood of sacrifice in. They shall be like the corners of the altar that were consecrated with the blood and oil of sacrifices. So there's a zeal. It is so, yet a sober recognition as well of the cost of being right with God. They may be yelling as if they are drunk. This isn't some drunken revelry. This is an exuberance founded upon faith, founded upon the worship of the Lord, founded upon sacrifice. The next verse says it so clearly. Clearly, the Lord, their God, will save them in that day as the flock of his people. The blood in those basins, the blood that is filling his people, the blood pouring over the altar can only be the blood of Christ upon the cross. That's the only blood that saves. For Christ came not with the blood of goats or calves, but with his own blood. He entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Reads Hebrews 9, verses 11 and 12. That's how the Lord saves the flock that is, is his people. They are sheep, and sheep are helpless. Domestic sheep can't protect themselves. They can't live out in the wild without a watchful eye. They fall into the water and drown because their wool weighs them down. I can't read this without thinking of two things. And the first is of Isaiah 53. And the other is Psalm 23. Isaiah 53 reads, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And who can forget the 23rd Psalm? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures, he leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Every line in that psalm speaks to the total helplessness of sheep, of the flock of God, at the mercy of the environment and the predator except for the watchful eye of the shepherd. We have a great shepherd, one that not only protects us, he wins for us. He sends his helpless sheep out into the world to live for him, and he fights the battles for us. And it says that his people, this flock, our helpless sheep, shall be like jewels of a crown, lifted up like a banner over his land. Now the ESV reads a little differently there, and it says, for like the jewels of a crown, they shall shine on his land. Now the word that's translated as lift up, lifted up like a banner or shining over the land is a word that speaks of a sign, a signal of some sort. And it's true that there were often banners um, when you're speaking of armies of the world banners that were used to signal different things or identify units and such. But of course, all you have to do is think of a lighthouse and you'll remember that signals can be sent by light as well. 
And we're talking about the jewels of a crown, after all, stones that seem to shine of their own accord at times. And that's exactly what is being said here. It's one of those wonderful reflexive words showing that the subject, the jewels, are actually doing the action, the shining. So the jewels are either shining of their own accord or lifting themselves up of their own accord. And so it makes more sense to say that they shine forth over the land and that is well within the parameters of the word that is used. Sometimes it's easy to translate too woodenly, not being able to see what is being said. And I know for sure I've done it myself a million times and couldn't kind of see the forest through the trees and had to force myself to see further, to realize that there's more than one way to translate a given word or more than one type of signal that can be seen in this case. And as you read this, doesn't it make you think about the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 14, where it says, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Isn't that shining over his land? Shining forth with his gospel message that his king has truly come. That Jesus has been born. He lived a human life and died upon a cross. Also that those who believe in him don't have to suffer eternal death. Hanukkah, the Feast of Dedication, is also called the Feast of Lights. And you are his lights, his jewels and his crown, through faith in Jesus Christ. It's through that faith that the blessing is realized. It's through that faith that you have life. And that's what verse 17 is all about. It's about life. Isn't it interesting that the Bible doesn't say that God is beautiful, but his works are. The grace and mercy of God is beautiful indeed. The life lived in his providence is good. It is a life at peace, a life washed in righteousness and true appreciation of your God. The good goodness, the blessing of the Lord knows no bounds, and his providence is bountiful. So the young men and the young women thrive. They thrive because of abundant blessings of the Lord, abundant food, abundant, abundant drink, and abundant families. The Lord has saved his people. He's made his flock the jewels of his crown through the sacrifice of Christ. And yet his people still wait. You still require his continued perseverance in protecting you from the world. For sin remains for now. Though the adversary has been conquered and your sins washed away, you wait for that total victory coming, not of the humble king riding on a donkey, but the return of the victorious and almighty king coming in power, coming in glory to glorify his people, coming in jubilation. That is what you wait for, my friends. So in the season of waiting, the season we call Advent, remember what the Lord has done. Remember that your king has truly come. Remember that he came to save. And remember that you are waiting for the return of your king. Wait on your Lord in faith, knowing that he came, that you are saved through faith in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. 
Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we are yours for you have called. Heavenly Father, we pray that as you send us forth as your weapon of a war of peace, we would serve you well. The nations truly would come to hear your name. We pray for the coming of your Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that his coming again, his victory, would come soon and very soon. Lord, we are yours, and we, Lord, we yearn to live for you completely in your kingdom. Lord, we pray, come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. And now be the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen.